This morning we're going to begin in Hebrews 9, 27. Let's all stand for the reading of God's word. <coughs> Hebrews 9, 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Father, please bless this word today and let us learn something we didn't know. And just help us to be drawn closer to you by the truth. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody be seated. Because of what we did in the Garden of Eden, we did not believe God when he told us don't eat that fruit. Instead, we thought he was lying and the devil was telling the truth. And we ignored God, we disobeyed God. So therefore, we introduced death into the world to mankind. And of course, the Bible said it's appointed for all of us to die once. But then, you're going to stand before judgment of God. I see people say it all the time when someone will die. They say, well, they're out of their misery. Not necessarily. If you die without Jesus, you've just jumped out of the pot into the fire, literally. But you know what, y'all? We're going to stand before God one day. And listen what this says in Genesis 3.22 because this explains it. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Now, unless he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. God gave us instructions on how to break the chains of this curse of death and hell. He showed us what to do. And what he told the early man was you take a lamb and you come and you slaughter it and let its blood pour out and give its life instead of you. Now, we know that lamb couldn't save you. But the faith in believing God was going to send us a special lamb, we use a little lamb as a substitute until that real lamb came. That's what it's about. And even in the very beginning with Cain and Abel, Genesis 4, 3, and in the process of time it came to pass, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Well, he brought something he was very proud of. He probably had some big pretty red tomatoes and yellow squash and Oh, a beautiful green okra. He brought it all to God. He was very proud of it. But listen, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the, his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. He didn't just bring him a sheep. He found the fattest one in the bunch, the healthiest, the prettiest, and he gave that to God. It's something how that is. But don't give God your scraps. Give him your best. You know, that's why people, you know, so many people over the years would get in a financial bind and they would quit tithing. And I tell them, you know what? Don't quit on God. You stay just like you are with God. It wouldn't be no time at all. I get a call. Well, I got the job of my dreams, Brother Russell. I'm making twice the money and I'm doing what I like to do. You can't outgive God. But you see, these two boys, one brought some beautiful vegetables and the other brought a living lamb. And God didn't want them vegetables. Why? Because that's not alive. It's living as we know plant life. But it's not something with blood and it's breathing and it's, bah, you know, it enjoys eating and sleeping and being petted. He brought the right thing. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. His countenance fell. You know, it's amazing how this worked out. Because he could have corrected himself. His brother tried to tell him, well, God don't want vegetables. God wants something with blood and it gives its life in our place. And, you know, and instead of his brother saying, well, that's what I'll do. I'll give you some tomatoes and turnips for a little sheep if you don't mind trading me. But he didn't do that. He got mad and killed his brother. You know, folks, it's just like today. You tell people the truth and they'll get mad at you. You tell them the hard truth and they'll quit liking you. And it's so easy to be saved, but people reject it, and it's out of ignorance. Anyhow, moving right along, you know, I want to say this, because today we have this little demonic saying, any religion's a good religion. Tell that to Cain, because his religion was tomatoes and okra, and God said, I don't want that garbage, and you can get that out of my sight. Folks, you can worship God the way you want to, and God will say, get out of my sight. 
or you can do it the way the Bible says, and God will not only have respect for your offering, but he'll have respect for you. I want to do it God's way, not man's way, not my way, not common sense way, the biblical way. Well, here's a command because death was coming to Egypt. Exodus 12, 3. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month I shall take to them every man a lamb, according to that to house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Now your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Thou shalt take it out of the sheep or from the goats. You know, this lamb is just like Jesus. It can't have a scar on it. It can't even have a spot on it. And it can't have no sores on it. Just like our Jesus. He wasn't spotted by the world. And he didn't have not one sin on his soul. Therefore, he was a fit appeasement for our soul. You know this already. I couldn't die for you because I'm a sinner like you. And you couldn't die for me because you've got your own sin to deal with. But Jesus had no sin. Therefore, he was the lamb. All this time we've been using little fuzzy lambs. But what it all boiled to, these were just a foretelling of the lamb of God. The son of God who is perfect without a spot or a blemish. And he would be sacrificed his blood and his life for us. And you shall keep it until the 14th day. 14 in the Bible means deliverance of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. You know, Israel congregated together in the evening and they killed Jesus. He was that lamb. He was that perfect lamb. They shall take the blood of that lamb and strike it on two posts of the door and the upper post of the house wherein they shall eat it. You know, when we get to the Lord's Supper, they took their same meal, their bread and their wine, and they ate it. Folks, you see, this is showing us that Jesus not only gave his blood and his life to save us, but his body is how you keep going. It's a spiritual nutrition. We don't eat the flesh of Jesus, but as a token, they sat up, while death passed over them, they had to have their strength because they were fixing to make a journey through a treacherous desert, heading to the promised land. That's what God promised them. You and I, we need our lamb for nourishment. We're having it now. That's what we're doing. Because we got a longer journey. We're headed to the promised land. And they went through scorpions and heat and thirst and drought and spiders and snakes. We're going through a lot worse. We've got Congress. But you know, folks, when you look at this right here and you see, this is very, very clear. And the blood shall be a token upon the houses where you are. I shall see that blood, and I will pass over you with death. That's what that means. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Folks, America has got a smiting coming. We're fixing to be smitten, and boy, do we deserve it. But listen, if you got the blood on the doorpost of your heart, the blood of the Lamb, you don't have to worry about death smiting you because it's going to pass right over. That's the promise of God. The Jews had their Lamb, but then 2,000 years ago, the real Lamb came and gave his blood. I had a lady in another religion told me, well, why do you like this blood stuff so much? That's because it's what saved me. Without the shedding of blood, you can't be so, oh, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that at all, she said. Well, the Bible says right here in Hebrews 9, 22, and almost all things by the law are purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. If Jesus wouldn't give his last drop of blood for you and I, we would still be eat up with sin on the road to hell. So I praise God for that blood. You know today... So many churches will not mention the blood. They won't talk about the blood. Folks, the blood is what made death pass over them in Egypt. And that's what's going to make hell pass over you one day. We, the blood is precious. But you know, we need to understand something. That God sent us the ultimate lamb. God's lamb. 
God's son. And you know, this Bible says in Luke 2, 7, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room at the inn for them. You know, folks, I, I made that backwards, but you got the point. Jesus was born in a manger because he was a lamb. He was born in a barn because he was the lamb of God. By the way, a manger is a, is a crib that they eat their hay out of. They put it in that crib, and they don't step on it and use the bathroom on it, and they can eat it when they get hungry. It's there in their little manger, in their little crib. But that's what Jesus had for a baby bed in a barn. God went all the way to show Israel this is that lamb. But they were so blinded by religion, they couldn't see it, and they nailed him to a cross. But that's what they were supposed to do. John 1, 29 says it like this. The next day, John sees Jesus. He's grown up now. Coming unto him to be baptized. That's what he was coming for. <coughs> and he says, Behold, look at this. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You know, folks, the Lamb, the little Lamb, it would cover your sin, uh, an atonement. But Jesus takes it away, never to be remembered again. And that's a powerful, powerful difference. And again, here we are, 1 Peter 1, 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, no sin to his account whatsoever. Well, people get confused about the Old Testament and New Testament. Why don't we sacrifice little lambs anymore, bulls or goats? Why can't we eat pork and catfish and shrimp now? And Couldn't eat none of that in the Old Testament. Do we do away with the Old Testament? No. We didn't do away with it. We finished it. The Old Testament was like the foundation of your house. The New Testament's the walls and the roof. It's a finished product. But you know, when you look at it, look how Jesus says it in Hebrews 10, 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. You know, when you take off in your car, you need a lot of power to get that big thing rolling. But then when you get it about 25, it shifts in the second gear because it's the next stage. When you get out there on the interstate, well, it'll shift on into third and fourth, maybe fifth, depending on what you got because it's what's needed for the job. The Old Testament is what was needed for the job at the time to make people understand there is a God and he requires certain things. The New Testament is when God came down to earth and gave us a pathway to heaven from his own mouth. And then he died and gave us his life. Hebrews 10.10 10, By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You don't have to sacrifice a dove every day. You don't have to kill a lamb every three months. You don't have to kill a bull every year for the whole church. Jesus died one time, and that's all she wrote. He only needed to die one time, y'all. And you know what? Hebrews 10, 11 goes on to say, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. Those bulls and goats can't take your sin away. They can't even count to ten or sing a song. That was a substitute of foretelling of the Lamb of God, as John said. You know, but this man, in verse 12, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Make no mistake about it. Jesus didn't destroy the Old Testament. He didn't tell you to quit reading it because that's where we get our foundation. But what he done, he come and completed it and he went back to heaven. And right now, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father and on your behalf. When you do something you did wrong and you say, Jesus, forgive me. He says, Father, they've just confessed and it's forgiven. That's how that works. But don't ever think that I've had people tell me, you're not supposed to use the Old Testament. That is so wrong. We don't do away with no part of the Bible. We just use the Old Testament and the New Testament together now. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus explained this the best way. Think not 
that I've come to destroy the law. That's the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments. Or the prophets. I've come not to destroy but to fulfill. And that's what he did. He, we have the finished product. <coughs> Excuse me, y'all. Allergies. In Hebrews 2, 9, it says this right here. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by he, the grace of God, should be, he should taste death for every man. Just like that little lamb gave his life for those that believed in the coming of the Messiah, Jesus gave his life for everybody. I mean everybody, folks, that wants it. Uh, we know that many have rejected him over the years. Stalin and Adolf Hitler and Attila the Hun. and They all rejected Christ. But you didn't. And he is your lamb. And he's come to wash your sins away. And he's there for you all the time. You know what? The thing about Jesus, they couldn't understand. He saved others. Why can't he save himself when he was hanging on the cross? And I've had people ask me that. Well, if he was God, couldn't he stop him from killing him? Well, sure he could have. He didn't even have to come to this world. But I just read to you that he created God, created himself a body lower than the angels so it could die. Can't kill God. But he made a body that could die. Suffer, bleed, sweat, thirst, hunger, have his feelings hurt. Acts 8 32 says, The place of the scripture which is read was this He was led as a sheep to the slaughterer, and like the lamb dumb before his shears, so he opened not his mouth. You know, that should have been a big sign. Whenever Pilate was saying, Are you the Son of God? Did you say that? All Jesus had to say was, I didn't say that, but he wouldn't say it. In, in fact, he said, you say I am, and that turned out to be true. That was a great sign that the Jews should have saw. Oh, excuse me a second. I'm trying to get this scratchy thing out of my throat. <coughs> Ragweed, I guess. <coughs> Got some spores down in there. <coughs> All right, I think I'm good now. You know, in the Bible it says in the Old Testament that Jesus would die on a cross and all that, but he, they wouldn't break a bone. You know, folks, when they, someone was crucified, a lot of people don't know this, many of their ribs were broken from that cat of nine tails. It'd break ribs. They had lead balls on it with a piece of bone that would just tear the meat off of you. But a lot of the people don't know this either. Usually when you were crucified, both sides of your jaws were broken. They beat you in the face so much it'd break your jaws. But not Jesus. They didn't break his jaws. They didn't break his nose. Whenever the evening came around, you couldn't hang on a cross overnight. Standard procedure was they came along and they would break your legs. You couldn't push yourself up to get a breath and you'd hang there and die. And that was what they did. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. So they didn't have to break his legs, that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Why didn't the Jewish priests say, man, I've never seen him not break nobody's bones before. That must be the Messiah. Because, folks, you can be so blinded by religion, you wouldn't recognize God if he came to your house. I see that every day. People are so caught up in their religion, they have no room for God whatsoever. That's where we are here. That's why they didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. They killed him. But that was all in the foretelling. That's how it had to be. Well, John 19.32 says, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already, and they break not his legs. You know, folks, make no mistake about it. Jesus died in your place and in my place. Somebody had to be a propitiation, an appeasement, a sacrifice. And there was only one that qualified for that, our Jesus. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, or however you want to say that, a propitiation, there's different ways of saying that. Through what? 
faith in his blood. You know what, folks? Put your faith in the blood Jesus gave up for you. His last drop. The Bible said after they pierced his side, the blood poured out and then water came out. And that shows he gave his last drop. To declare what? His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. How dare people say I'm going to heaven because I quit sinning. Or I seen the light. Or I got right. You're going to heaven because of his righteousness. You and I don't have any. But if you believe and have faith in that blood that he gave for you, then his righteousness will be loaned out to you. So when you stand before God and God says, Are you righteous? Jesus will say, Yes, Father, I gave of mine. That might not sound like much today, but when you stand before God, that's going to be the most important words you've ever heard in your life. In Mark 14, 22, And as they did eat at the Lord's Supper, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take eat. This is my body. And he took the cup that he had given thanks. And he gave it to them. And he said, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood. You know, folks, I, I'll tell you something. This is when they sit in that room and they had their nutrition from the lamb. They didn't actually eat the blood of Jesus and his flesh. But what he's trying to say is he gave his flesh. He gave his blood. And today that is the source of our strength. We don't physically put it in our mouth and chew it and swallow it. But it is our nutrition, spiritual nutrition, that he gave all of that to us. We are so blessed. He said unto them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which was shed for many. You know, folks, I, I have to say it again. I don't deserve to go to heaven. And you don't deserve to go to heaven. But God took our whipping. And he put it on Jesus who didn't deserve it. God took our beating and our death and our hell. And he gave it to Jesus in our place. How can we not be grateful? How can we not get up and come to church on Sunday morning? That's all he asks. Sing a song to him and tell him thank you. That he gave his life that you don't never have to die. Oh, folks, we need to be grateful and I say 53, 5, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Folks, one day we're going to stand before God. And it's going to be a test whether the devil has got you. And believe me, you don't want that. Or whether you belong to God. The Bible is very clear. Only those that can overcome the devil are going to go to heaven. And I'm going to tell you right now, you and I, we cannot overcome the devil. But boy, we got a precious friend that can and will and does. And right now, if you are born again, listen to what this Bible says. And they that overcame him by the blood, overcame the devil. And they, in Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. You know something? Grab all the gusto you can because you only go around once. Another lie right out of hell. You give your life to Jesus, and he'll give it back to you, polished, cleaned, and better than you ever thought you could live. You know, some people are so consumed by their sin they think they can't have Jesus because it would disrupt their lifestyle folks I'm going to tell you something if you give up that lifestyle of evil and sin and you give your life and heart to Jesus he'll make you happier than you thought you could ever be and not only that but when we stand in judgment one day we'll be okay <clears throat> Some people ain't going to heaven in Revelation 21, 27. And there shall in no wise enter into the, in anything that defileth, or whosoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. People that are full of religion, 
people that are full of good works and they think God owes them, people that are self-righteous and think they're better than everybody, i got bad news for them because those things will not enter into the kingdom of heaven, only those that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And today, read your Bible. See which sins are called an abomination. They're listed right here as well. People today, they've lost their morals. People today don't care what the Bible says. They go to these occult churches and they get them all hopped up on emotion and make them think they got something we don't have. And what they got is poison doctrine that's leading them down the road of destruction. Because you see, folks, this breaks my heart every time I read it. In Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. What is the will of the Father? That you come to Jesus. God is not willing that any perish, but all would come to repentance to Jesus. Many, boy, that's upsetting to hear that. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name we've cast out devils even. In thy name we've done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Folks, make no mistake about it. Being a Baptist or a Catholic or a Pentecostal, that's not going to give you a free ticket. Trying to be good, even coming to church every Sunday, that's not going to get you into heaven. This says, haven't we prophesied? That's preachers. Preachers are preaching today, and they're on the road to hell because there's only one way, and it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Let me tell you what, if you got saved and you didn't change, there's something wrong. If you got saved and you can cuss and use God's name in vain and don't bother you, there's no Holy Ghost living in your heart. Or stealing or lying or hating people. No, that don't fit in with the Christian walk. When you got saved, there was a change came over. Oh, you ain't perfect and I don't pretend for you to be or me either. But there was a change came over us when we got saved. You know, there's places you used to go if you went there now with the Holy Spirit You'd be so uncomfortable, you'd have to run out of that place. The way we used to talk, now that you got the Holy Spirit, you don't talk like that no more. It's a fact. Therefore, again, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And old things are passed away. Behold, things are becoming new. Well, do we do that to get saved? No, we do it because we got saved. The Holy Ghost moved in and the devil had to move out. But listen, y'all, in Matthew 7, 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many be that go in thereat. Folks, you hear what that's saying? That's saying a lot of people are going into hell. And it's because they're being lied to, and they think they're okay. I never killed anybody. It don't matter if you did. If you did kill somebody, Jesus will forgive you. But if you didn't kill anybody and you don't get saved, you're still going to hell. Because straight is the gate, never is the way that leads to life, and few be that find it. Don't presume you're going to heaven. Read your Bible and make sure you're going to heaven, that you've done what you're supposed to do. Because like this says, it's a straight gate, folks. You don't just go through life wide open and rope it. It's not a, boy, I was lucky. No, if you're, first of all, I'm going to say this. If you're saved, you know you're saved because you've done what you needed to do to get saved. Did you ever ask Jesus to save you? Well, I didn't do that, but I've been going to church all my life. <clears throat> Wrong answer. Let me show you something, folks. In Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't say nothing about quit sinning. It don't say nothing about joining a church. It don't say nothing about putting your money in that offering plate. Romans 10, 9. If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you really do believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not a material thing. It's not a legalism deal. It's not a monetary deal. It's a faith deal. 
We didn't believe him in the garden, but he gives you a chance to believe him now. And that's why we celebrate Christmas, the greatest gift that was ever given, the gift of eternal life through God's Son. Let me add, who gave his life for you? Today you can be saved. The good thing is <clears throat> you can be saved in your bed tonight, on your way home. You can be saved sitting at a red light. That's between you and God. Don't even need a preacher. But with your mouth out loud, you say, Jesus, I believe you died on that cross. And because I know you're God, you had the ability to come back from the dead, and I believe that. Now save me, Lord. Wash my sins away with the blood of that lamb that you are. And folks, this Bible said if you do that, you're saved immediately. And you cannot get unsaved because he bought you. He bought you with his blood. And you belong to him. And immediately he said, I'm going to build you a mansion in glory. That when you walk through them pearly gates and see your house, you're not going to believe your eyes. It's there and it's free because he bought it. He paid the price. The lamb of God. Born in a barn in a manger. Our great Messiah lowered himself to the animal state to save your soul. Took a beating like nobody could ever imagine. He did that for you. The people say, nobody loves me. I could slap them when they say that. <laughs> After what Jesus did for you, nobody loves you? You better read your Bible and go to church. Amen. Let's pray, y'all. Thank you, Jesus, for a a wonderful message in this Christmas season. And Father, we just will never be able to thank you for the greatest gift that was ever given. Your precious son, who never sinned once, but he died for ours. Father, we had a debt we could not pay, and Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. And because of that, we have heaven to look forward to, and we have hope. Father, thank you so much. If there's one here today that's lost and never been saved, speak to that heart. Let them come talk to me now so we can pray together and make sure they do it right and they can leave this little old country church with everlasting life. In Jesus, the Lamb of God, we pray. Amen. Come on, y'all.